there, strategic entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We're here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode 25 of the Strategic Entrepreneur Podcast. On today's show, we're digging into decision making and how and when to spend your money versus working with free options and DIY approaches. But first, what have we been doing this week? There's also there's always that particular spot when we suggest books, and I usually do suggest books, Crystal, but it's nonfiction. This time, I'm going to suggest a fiction book, and it's called Circe. Uh, you can't see it if you're not on YouTube, but I'm showing it anyway to the viewers, and it's from uh, Madeline Miller. Uh, now, the reason why I'm suggesting this book is uh, uh, I didn't really read any mythological fantasy uh, ever, I would say. I read epic fantasy, like dark fantasy, grim dark, but this particular genre, never read, like uh, this uh, author um, is conveying it. And it was like mind blowing. So. I'm suggesting this book uh, this week because I do believe if you really like genuinely writ good uh, written books, this book is for you. It's basically the story of a secondary character from the uh, Odyssey uh, with the uh, Ulysses or Odysseus. Um, and she's a goddess and a witch. And she has a very small part in the Odysseus uh, stories, but this in this book she gets all the story and um madeline really came up with the world building kind of things uh even in this world we know how the story turns out we know what happens but she made out uh, a book that is like uh, over almost 400 pages long and it's gripping every single page and i learned a lot about this particular genre and i'm trying to um, I already wrote something like similar in the past. It's called like Soul of Stone before even reading this book. But I found out, gosh, this is so much similar to this book. And, and it's so much, I had so much fun writing that story. So I'm digging more, digging more on this kind of fantasy genre. So definitely, uh, I suggest uh, this book. It's a New York Times bestselling book. And it's really, really, really uh, well written, uh, Crystal. This for my reading of the week. Uh, authorly wise, uh, what I've been up to, uh, I've been actually trying to study a bit more about uh, mailing lists and newsletter, and I'm working on a new welcoming sequence for uh, potential readers and people interested in my works. And I'm uh, working on Sandfox this time, which is a service we spoke, spoke in, the, in a previous episode. So I'm trying to do the shift from MailChimp to Sandfox, but it's a new service uh, to me. I need to learn uh, the nuts and bolts of it, uh, not to screw it up because like welcoming sequence are super important uh, and Crystal has been uh, very kind with her time and generous. Uh, she, she is trying to help me also to uh, plan a strategy. And um, yeah, you know, uh, it's not something easy, uh, copy editing and welcoming people uh, so I'm really trying to nail this down and make it right the first time. It's never going to happen because I'm going to change stuff. Uh, but I really, I'm really trying to make this uh, an experience that is going to be good uh, for the reader. So I've been working on this uh, crystal in the past few uh, days. And also I am working on the eighth story now of my 12 by 20 challenge. Um, and I'm having fun. Uh, with it. I'm not sure if it's going to be uh, done uh, soon, but I do know what's the theme and I know what's the stakes, which is way more than I would say for other story where I just started out and I had no idea where to go. So I guess that's uh, something more um, from uh, with respect from the point that I started out to, in this year, 2020. So I'm learning. I'm basically learning new things. And uh, what have you been learning in this uh, past week? Well, I have been working through the Let's Get Digital book, which we talked about 
uh, last episode. The fourth edition has come out. It's by David Gochran and it's available now. So it's how to self-publish and why you should. So I'm not exactly a newcomer to this industry. So it's not so much that I need to figure out how all this works. But for me, rereading it just to make sure that you know, everything I'm recommending to people is still accurate and what other people are recommending. And also I find it's a nice way to go through my own stuff and do a bit of an inventory when I read a book like this by someone else and they talk about their process and the steps and what they go through. It's just a little glimpse into someone else's way of doing things. And so I like to do that every so often and just review my own processes of how I'm writing, releasing, publishing. Is there anything that I could be integrating that David talks about in his book that I've not been integrating in mine? And we will get to talking about some of that stuff over the next few episodes. But um, for now, it's just a really good kind of reminder for me of all the different pieces and a good way of checking up on myself and making sure that I am adhering to all the things that I know are the best practices and that I am also just being flexible enough to integrate whatever new things are coming up. Anytime people have gained a lot of experience in an industry, they meet people at conferences and get connected through different opportunities. And so you never know what you don't know until you discover it in something like one of these books. So um, I'm excited to see where that goes. I haven't finished it all yet, uh, rereading it. So we'll see what else I find. But for me, this week has really been focused on closing circles, which is a concept that my mom actually taught me when I was little. And whenever we would get overwhelmed or feel too frustrated about something, it was usually because we were a little overloaded. And so mom would say, okay, you just have too many open circles. How, how are you going to close those up? And open circles are really just undone tasks that are using up your memory and your energy to keep track of them. Now, David Allen wrote a book called Getting Things Done, and he uses open circles as a concept. And that book is super famous. So most people think that that's where I got it from. Um, but I'm going to give my mom a shout out credit here because she was teaching us about that before that book came out. <laughs> so good job, mom. And for anyone who wants to learn about the power of closing circles, that book by David Allen has been uh, redone and re-released recently as well. So uh, we'll link to that in the show notes along with the other books we talked about. But it is a great resource in terms of learning how to organize information and learning how to develop your own systems around calendaring and dealing with stuff that's incoming at you all the time. And how do you organize that? And how do you organize appointments? And how do you kind of keep your stuff together, basically. And I have had great success following a lot of the recommendations in that book. And the new one has been updated to kind of include digital stuff. When I first read that book, it was over 15 years ago, and it was all about file folders and physical papers and everything else. And so now it's been uh, dusted off and shined up for the modern age, which is great. Now, we're going to dig into how do we spend our money and also talk about how do you know when you should and when you should try to do stuff yourself and talk about some differences in those answers depending on what stage of your author career you're at because your answer for your first book or your third book is not going to be the same as your 11th book or your 13th book. So for you, maybe first let's talk about just quickly, what is your sort of approach in general to finances in your strategic entrepreneur life? So I use an approach that I've basically been using for, for my adult life, I would say, for financing. Um, I have a budget and I don't go over that. Um, and this is something that has worked for me, uh, but it's very difficult uh, to understand how much you need for things. So. For example, uh, let's take, let's break down this thing with um, an example that interests um, me. Uh, how do I go about uh, budget, budgeting things? Uh, one year ago, I published my first uh, um, self-published, of course, uh, um, uh, dark fantasy book, Lord of Time, the very first one that I have uh, written in English and published in the U.S. and North American market. Now. 
I had no idea how much I needed, for example, for the promotion side of things. And I really didn't know, like for editing, how much it, it was going to be. Um, in that case, that was my benchmark. What I was trying to do in that first instance was uh, don't fret too much. This is your first work. Uh, you don't have to go busted. How much is that you can afford? Uh, you are, in that case, I was uh, 32. You are 32. Uh, hopefully, you're not going to die soon. So you're going to have a lot more instances to learn from this uh, lunch. What I did was this. I chose a number that I was comfortable with, with promotion. So I'm telling you this number now, which is a ridiculous number. It's super low. I said, I'm going to spend $200 on the pro promotion kind of thing. So uh, if I needed to uh, book uh, promo sites, for example, $200 was the maximum cap. I couldn't go over that. Not possible. Can't do that. Of course, you have to self-impose that to yourself because that's a beautiful thing. and the not so beautiful things of self-publishing, you have nobody that is taking your hand off the wallet. So you have to be extremely, um, how would you say, you have to be extremely draconian, you have to be extremely careful with what you're doing. But in my case, if I put that number over there, 200, I'm not going to go over that. So that's how much I spent to promote Lord of Time. Uh, did it become a, a best-selling book? Absolutely not. I. Uh, I would say mm, I, am, have, I am going to do the checking for the years uh, since it was uh, uh, published at the end of August uh, in a few uh, days now. Uh, but if everything went well, I broke even with this book. Uh, uh, going on the editing, uh, how much it costed, the promotional kind of things, the hard copies that I bought and purchased and sold uh, in uh, physical places, I... I would say I barely broke even, maybe I made some money. So uh, I wouldn't call that a success per se, per se. But why this important, this story? Why am I telling that to you? Because it's just one damn book, only one. And I'm planning to release way more of them uh, in the next months and years, again, hopefully. Um, what this is all about is, uh, Something we already said more than once um, in the previous episodes, it's don't bleed out, especially at the beginning. The budget is my way to protect myself against uh, weird jumps of my mind. So if I would have been reckless, I would have said, this is my first book. Uh, it needs to be a success because if, if it's not, it means I'm a failure as an author, right? I've been working on that book for two years. So I need to push it. I need to do everything I can, go bankrupt. <laughs> well, not that much, but I know it's the thought that goes over in so many authors' minds. So my way of dealing with that crystal is budgeting. And I'm going to do that for the next release of uh, the next book. But this is basically the way I go about the spending money uh, at the moment I am now after having published, uh, published uh, only one book, uh, full-length novel, like almost 50,000 words, because I also published other shorter stories. Uh, now, I know that the way you, Crystal, go about this, it's different, because you are an author at the different moment in your writing career. And other um, authors that are spending tens of thousands of dollars uh, uh, every month, um, have a different kind of approach. So I give you my five cents on that. Uh, I really want to know what do you think uh, of this budgeting thing? So if you have a benchmark, uh, if you have suggestions for people that are at different moment, uh, what do you say? Yeah, I think we actually don't come at it that differently. I think because of my past experiences of, you know, doing all the things everybody said you needed to do and just, okay, well, if we invest more in marketing or we put more money into the product preparation side or whatever that it will eventually come back and that isn't actually true and so there is no guarantee that because you spend more you will make more that isn't how publishing works and so i think that is a dangerous kind of a trap in that we can absolutely justify any cost that someone tells us is going to help us sell more books but 
what it comes down to is, is it going to help you sell enough more books to pay for the decision to do that thing? And my, my driving philosophy has been, there will be no debt to do this part because this is my second or third publishing de career, depending on how you break up the pieces. Um, but I was very determined that my, my only restriction is that I can't spend what is not in my publishing account. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean I can only spend what I've made from other books, because obviously that wouldn't work for the first little while because you don't have any product to sell starting out. So I seeded myself it from my day job and from taking on teaching commitments and doing other things where I have, well, it was, it was actually a jar on the counter back in the day when I was waitressing, I would bring home, I had a set amount I had for my tips that had to go into the bank for basic bills and things every day. But anything above that amount that was in the tin on the counter was spending money and that spending money could go to whatever I wanted. And so I was applying that to my um, book publishing account. And so that's how we did a lot of our publishing for our kids books. But also now with my romance novels, every penny I make in royalties goes back into my publishing account. And when I take on other projects or other jobs that will pay me, whether it's a speaking gig as an author or um, maybe I take on coaching a client to help with their project or something like that, that money can go back into my publishing fund. Now, I am very privileged and my husband currently is taking care of the household bills, which means that my business can be a separate thing. It doesn't have to support our family at this point. So I definitely acknowledge his support in that way and also um, acknowledge my own privilege that I can be in a position to do that. Now, to be clear, I have not been in that position for a good portion of my life. This is a very recent development. So I am extre extremely excited about being able to do this transition. But I think the important piece is there is no magic amount of money that has to be in an account. When I first started out, I did all my editing myself or I traded with other people. Um, I used the tools that were available, whether it was you know, spell checking in Microsoft Word or whatever to do the best I could. I had my mom spell check things for me, um, family members, friends, whatever, and, and really did start out using everything free. I designed all my own covers and did all my own layouts, like everything. I would just find a free tool that could do what I needed to do. I would take the time and energy to learn how to use that. And then I would put out the best product I could with the budget I had, which was pretty much non-existent. And then the first few stories, once they're out and you can start generating a little bit of revenue, then you can start putting that money back into that publishing account. The biggest thing I think for me was that I wasn't willing to risk running ads or spending a lot of money on stuff that I couldn't guarantee I was going to make back. And so I decided, uh, if you listen to our last episode on the firehose approach to content or advertising as two options for building your career, I chose the content route for the first couple of years of my writing romance career because I was not willing to risk the financial investment required to go all in on the advertising and I was trying to put out a lot of content in a short period of time, which is really expensive if you're paying for every part of things. And so I think what you really want to analyze is where do you get the most bang for your buck? So I knew, okay, well, I have a thousand dollars in my account that I have saved that I can spend on making books. So what are my options here? Well, if I get a pro writing aid subscription on Black Friday, then I could get a whole year's or I could get a lifetime subscription for, I don't know if it was $150 or whatever it was, but that saved me a fortune when it got to paying an editor, right? So when I was looking at, well, if I spend this 150 now on this thing that I will have a lifetime of use out of, then that's going to make every book that comes after it better. And it's going to make any services I do pay for a lot cheaper. Same with Vellum was a choice of, okay, I used to use um, InDesign and draft I've used all the things to do the layouts for my books over the years. 
but vellum is super fast and it's easy to learn to use and it would it cost i think about two hundred dollars for the base one when i bought it now it's about 300 because they have the print edition worked into it as well but when I look at what it was going to cost me to hire somebody to publish my books for me or to do the layouts for me, it saved me thousands of dollars in those first two years. So when I was choosing, okay, out of my thousand dollars, what's going to get me the most mileage, the, the layouts being done and an initial polishing being done was really high on the list because I think even though it's, it's, best if you can get your books professionally edited or proofread if you can get it very very clean yourself as a starting place you you can always go back later if you want to have those first books polished up if they're part of a series or whatever but you'll get a pretty good idea if people are interested in your characters and the world you've created and the rest of what you're building by that time so that you know it's a smart investment does that make sense? And then, I mean, covers are really, those are really somewhere where you should not try to make your own unless you are actually a designer um, or are willing to invest in courses and software and really go all in. Like the amount of hours I've spent working on covers over the years is hundreds and hundreds. And it's something that I love. And so I enjoy playing with the design software and figuring out how all that works. Was that efficient? Hell no, <laughs> it was not a smart way to go, but it was, it was, it's part of my process. And so for me, it does make sense. But for most people, I would say, if you're choosing where to spend your money, then your cover is your absolute priority. Um, and then your editing and your layout options as well. But I think one thing people um, forget is there are there's a whole range of price points for all of these services as well. So um, when we talk about covers, there's lots of options that it doesn't have to be a full custom cover job with a photo shoot and all of those things. You know, there are options of pre-made professional looking covers that start at like 30 to 50 dollars and go up to two or three hundred is fairly standard for that type of of a cover um so i think that's definitely something to think about when you're budgeting is you can you can treat it like dials the items on your budget can be like um or like sliders is probably a better way to describe that you can slide your if you know your range for your cover is fifty dollars to three hundred you can maybe slide the cover cost down a little bit if you need to slide your editing costs up a little bit in order to help you get the maximum kind of quality product you can for the budget you have available. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's very important. Like you were mentioning before the cover, absolutely. That's something that is very, very important. If you don't know how to do it or you're not a designer, please don't do it. <laughs> should be one of the things that it's most important for you uh, to realize. And uh, I want to drop a couple of mention to resources. There is uh, one website that is called Go On Write uh, that actually makes uh, good uh, pre-made covers for 30 to 50 bucks. So goonwrite.com, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there is another website that is called One Under Covers. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Bonnie Goldberg, which we interviewed, she used that service uh, to make her own uh, uh, book cover and it was great it was amazing uh, there is another service that i personally use it's called 99 designs uh, now these covers are going to be a bit more expensive on the expensive side uh, but it works more of a, like a competition you basically make a brief and then designers compete to get of course the price of your money um, and i think the last time i used it was 299 for the uh, basic price uh, and then there is uh, the um, gold and then the platinum one. And then with the platinum one, you might get 80 to 100 uh, submission from really, really good uh, uh, artists. So it depends. Again, as Crystal said, it depends on how much you can spend. But there are a lot of um, resources out there and tools that can help you definitely craft a, a good cover on a budget. Um, just to add to the resource list, if you are thinking of designing your own cover, there's a course uh, that is through the Mark Dawson series of courses, which is with Stuart Fache, who does professional cover design, but 
there's a course in there that's quite affordable and will teach you how to make covers and has really specific examples in all different genres. So if you are going to tackle it yourself, I would highly recommend investing. I want to say it's about $150, but you'd have to double check the website. Um, but I found that one was very good, very well put together and really, really helpful in terms of teaching you practical skills on how to build a cover. And on the other things that I wanted to mention, you, Crystal, said the editing and the cover. Absolutely. There is another thing that I did in 2019, which was uh, uh, investing on my formatting of the inside of the book. I did purchase Vellum. Um, that was a big, huge expense for me, but boy, am I happy I did that. Uh, you have no idea how many hours have I saved. Now, at this point, I uh, published uh, uh, six stories and I'm on way to publish the seventh and the eighth. I have no idea how many dozens of hours I would have had to spend on the formatting every single time without counting the update because Crystal, I did update the stories, of course, while they were uh, being re um, uh, reviewed and I was getting feedback. So no idea, no idea. I'm just so grateful that I spent uh, those money. Uh, again, I was in the position I could do that. Uh, I had to really save up uh, to get that resource. But again, one other thing that you want, if you can, um, if you value time in that regards a bit more than money, then something like Vellum really, really uh, saves you a lot of time. And another resource that I'm finding, it costed, but again, it's saving me a lot of time. And it's not something you can delegate this thing. It's something just a service can do for you. And I'm talking about book funnel. It's an easy way to provide your book in any format you want to the hands of your readers. Imagine you have to deliver your book in Mobi format or EPUB or, or a, a PDF to a person that doesn't know, have, has any idea of how to run that uh, file in uh, their device. It's going to get you crazy. Book funnel uh, has a, a customer service that uh, is going to help people that have problems dealing with that uh, issue if the issue arises. And it's a platform that you can use for so many more things that uh, are not uh, just delivering your content. It's important because it's basically a platform you can use to give a way to get um, your books out there that is not a store like Amazon. So it's a, a bit more on the independent side. And you can use it for a book promotion, for building up your newsletter. I cannot recommend this service enough. Uh, and really, it saved me a lot of time. And uh, I do believe, Crystal, we have uh, like uh, uh, a code or something that uh, actually are going to help people save me some money. If they, uh, I, I use this uh, and I save, if I'm not mistaken, 50 bucks on the medium author list um, uh, option, which was great. So probably we can put a link on that if people are interested in uh, um, purchasing that uh, um, book funnel. So definitely, yeah. So definitely, uh, Bellum uh, for the book uh, formatting of your interior for the design, and definitely I'm using again for delivering your content in a professional way, book funnel. So editing, uh, we talked about the importance of it, of it, making covers and make sure that they are professional. There are several ways in several venues you can get uh, uh, covers professionally done. Um, the internal, the way it's presented, uh, the book to the reader is important. Uh, and you will have to do it every single time if you don't have something like Vellum, of course. You can do it with Scrivener. I did that for years. It did take its time. It's a bit faster than doing it with Word. But again, that comes down to how many times you have and how you can uh, use it instead of money. And then uh, easy, effective way to deliver your content that is not uh, a store like Amazon or, or Kobo or Barnes and Nobles. I think these are the things for me, Krista, people uh, should really think about, uh, authors should really think about not to save up money, maybe, but just to invest this. Thinking of their author business 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's really important to have a sense of what your intentions are as an author and how you intend to grow your career and how much you intend to grow your career for some people they really they want to publish a couple of books and that's all and it's a passion project it's not that they're trying to build an ongoing publishing empire that's going to last for years and so 
if you're in a position where you only intend to do a handful of projects in the next few years, maybe you don't buy all these tools, right? Maybe you do hire somebody for $50 or $100 to use their copy of Vellum to lay out your book because you know, you don't need to buy all the things and learn to use all the things unless you're going to use them enough times. So for me, the question to ask yourself is, um, how many books do you think you're going to publish in the next three to five years? And how much would it cost to pay somebody to do that for you for the next three to five years? If you have a day job or, or some other way of earning money, how many hours would you have to work to pay for somebody else to do that. Because if you have the kind of job where you could work for two hours and pay for all five of those books to be laid out, then it doesn't make sense to learn to do it yourself unless it's just because you love it. So you really have to do a cost benefit analysis and think about how does that work? And I think one more piece to think about in that same vein is if you are going to hire something out, you want to make sure it's something that is a one-off project. So if you are hiring somebody to do your book covers, for example, you hire them to do a cover, they do it, it's over. If you hire somebody to do an interior layout for you, and then you want to change, you want to update your, your front and back matter in two months, because you've learned a bunch about how things work. And, you know, now you have to pay them again to make those changes, because you can't make the changes yourself. So when we talk about sustainability, from a tools perspective and from a systems perspective inside of your author world, that's one of the things that comes up is if you hire somebody to do it, can you still access your source files? Can you make those changes? What's it going to cost you to update things and keep them current as you go? And so that is a really important thing to ask yourself. There's actually a series of questions that I use to help analyze every opportunity that comes my way. Uh, and I think they might be helpful for you also. So the first question is, how much will this opportunity cost me? Whether it's a chance to be part of a certain type of promotion or whether it's a new tool that comes across my desk, what will it cost? Okay, that's question one. Question two, uh, well, and I should say, how much will it cost in money? And how much will it cost in time? Because it might be the coolest tool ever, but if it's going to take you 100 hours to learn it, then that's actually expensive. Yeah. There is a, a third currency that I use also, energy, like a mind energy and stuff, like time, money, energy. Yes, absolutely. And the second question is, will it actively generate revenue? So if you're looking at, okay, if I put out this product, using this thing, will that help generate more revenue? Yes, probably it will. If it's, oh, it will make my website look fancier. Will that translate directly to revenue? Nope, probably not. Uh, so you need to look at it as what is the function of the thing that you're spending that money on and what will it add for that investment? I also will do the math of how many books would I have to sell to pay for this? So let's say I put a book on a 99 cent promo on Bargain Booksy. I'm going to get 70 cents roughly for each book that sells because I've been smart and I've used my, uh, my match pricing from KDP so that I'm still getting the 70%. Okay, so I'm getting 70 cents per book sold. It's going to cost me how much? Like, $50. I don't remember how much that one costs, but let's say it's going to cost me $50 to do that. Yes. So I would have to sell at least 71 books just to make back what it cost me for running that promo. Okay. So it's useful to do that math because sometimes we get an opportunity that would actually, maybe we'd have to sell a thousand books to make that worthwhile, right? If and so then you need to think about, OK, what are my odds of selling that many? And so often promotional websites or anyone who's trying to sell you something that they're telling you will help your sales should have statistics to back that up. So if you go on um, BookBub and you want to do a promo, it will be OK. It's going to cost twelve hundred dollars to be part of a promo in this particular romance category. But 
3 million people will see it and the average download for those type of emails is 20,000 or whatever it is, then you can do the math. You can multiply the, you know, 20 cents you're going to make off each book um, by that 20,000 and decide if it's worth doing. Keeping in mind always that it's going to be an average probably a high average that they're using as those stats. And you may not be that high average if you are starting out and you don't have as many reviews and you're not as established. And, you know, depending on how well your product is put together, you may not get the average results. So just being a little bit conservative in your analysis about how many books you have to sell to pay for something. Um, you can also ask what other good effects will doing this have? Because sometimes being in a promo might result in X number of downloads. Maybe you're giving your book away for free. And so maybe you're paying $50 to get on a free promo site where maybe 10,000 new people are going to download a book. So you're not going to make anything directly off that opportunity. But if you get read through, if that's the first book in a series, then you might sell way more copies of your other books following that promotion. So it may have really good impact and be totally worth the money, even though it doesn't immediately generate revenue by that specific action. So taking some time to analyze that is always a good strategy before deciding if something is in fact a good opportunity. And I think one more thing to look at is alignment. So will this get me the right kind of readers? Because it's one thing, if it gets you a whole bunch of views and a bunch of people download your free book, but if none of them are readers in your genre, or if most of them don't read in your specific sub niche of that genre, that may not actually help you in the long term, right? It might skew your also bots and it might get the wrong kind of people on your mailing list because they're not really interested in what else you have to offer. So I do think looking at how closely is this opportunity aligned with your vision, your values, and your brand is really, really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the effect that we'll have, you were mentioning like those 10,000 people, maybe they're not going to give you any money, but what if like 30 or 50 of them or even more leave a review, like leave reviews, you'll have to consider that you save that money to a service like, for example, Book Sirens or uh, Hidden Gems, where you actually have to uh, use, allocate some resource to get some uh, eyes on that book and so getting some reviews so there are a lot of cascade kind of effect that you might consider visibility for your website for your previous published work if you already have a backlist like you can possibly predict everything but i guess what crystal is saying you can prepare yourself as best you can with the data you have the resources that you have and you can get your platform ready for this in this case promo get yourself ready, set yourself for success. And there was actually something that I wanted to ask you, like uh, in your author career, when did you decide, uh, for example, okay, I can't do this. Uh, I need to hire somebody else to do that for me. Like what are the metrics that you use usually? So I have an interesting set of metrics, <laughs> which is often it's, when I really don't want to do something, to be perfectly honest, if there's something that has a really high resistance threshold for me, that sometimes knowing that I'm going to have to do the editing myself to a really extensive degree is actually enough to make me not want to finish the book. And so if it's something like that, where it's going to have a really negative impact, then I know I need to invest the money into hiring somebody to give me feedback on that book so that I can just keep going and stay in story mode. Um, another example is if I'm going to need to schedule social media stuff. Um, well, the podcast is a perfect example. I absolutely love doing this podcast and I, I enjoy the editing part and I enjoy all the pieces, but the transcriptions for me are because it's hard. It's so hard. And also the, um, the scheduling of all of it, the technical stuff after it's all set. I know how to do all of those things, but I was finding that the extra time that that was taking away from my other creative projects was creating challenges in keeping me motivated to do it. And so 
that for me, the cost benefit analysis is okay. Well, if that's taking, you know, eight hours out of my week for those two things, and I could pay for those with, by working for a couple of hours at another project, it just makes sense to me to keep the energy flowing in a positive way by doing that. So for me, that's one of the biggest metrics um, is, do I like it? Is it interesting? And does it make me say, hell yeah, or, oh goodness, I have to do that thing and I really don't want to. So really you can get, you can do a really quick inventory with yourself of whether or not it's something you want to do um, just by seeing how you feel. Like what does your body language do? Do you kind of slump over or do you perk all up and look all bright and shiny? And, you know, just talking to somebody about the steps in the process for something, you can see it on their face when they're like, oh, and then I have to do this. And you can just feel it's like popping a balloon and there's just poof flat right and so I think that is really important to recognize in ourselves which are the pieces we're super resistant to and which are the pieces that really drain the energy out of us because those are going to be harder to get the momentum going um so for me that's often that's often the case and I think also I look at what can I hire out that doesn't impact the brand, the feeling of the brand, if that makes sense. Like for me, I've built a brand for my author stuff that's very much me. And so if I hire somebody to do those pieces of connecting with my readers and, you know, some people have admin assistants who answer their emails and handle all that kind of stuff and do their newsletter scheduling and all of those things. But for me, I find any distance that I create between me and the readers uh, it has huge ill effects in terms of me connecting with people in a real way. And a lot of my writing energy comes from sharing directly with the readers the outcome of that. And I, for me, that's where I get the energy to keep going on things. And so I need to not hire out those parts because hiring somebody to do those has an impact on the finished content. Whereas hiring somebody to do the technical parts of the podcast or um, to do the layout on a book. It has no impact because they're using the same software I would use. I've already written the words. I've already decided what's going to go where. It's just, it's a mechanical assistance. It's not a creative assistance. And I think that's the important piece to look at is will adding someone else into that process enhance the product you're getting? So if I was just starting out and I was hiring somebody to help me with the layouts who knew a lot more about book layouts and marketing than I did, then that would absolutely make sense because it's going to move you forward in that um, as well. So what will hiring that person add into the mixture is also really important to be aware of. But then now I'm building up on that. Uh, um, that's important. Uh, but when do you really understand, okay, that's the maximum I will do with the resources that I have now? When do you know, like, how you have to stop? Well, I think that's having a budget, whether it's an envelope or a spreadsheet or um, an actual bank account, however, you're going to track that, I think you need to know what you are comfortable investing and you, you have to track your expenses. You have to track your receipts. And of course, you've listened to our earlier episodes about treating your writing like a business. And so I'm sure you have a spreadsheet because we gave you a template for one. And you are naturally entering your expenses and keeping all of that for your accountant at the end of the year. So you already are rocking this. We have every faith that you're doing this. So you do need to know, okay, what what is my threshold? And Sometimes that may mean you make a decision, you know, not to order takeout one night and you put that money into your publishing fund to, you know, increase your budget a little bit. There, there are ways to make that happen. Um, maybe it's your birthday and you, you tell anybody who would normally give you a birthday gift that really all you want is a contribution to your, your book dream fund, right? And so there, there are ways to make this work, even if you don't necessarily have enough disposable income to be adding from that. Um, but it's really about indicating priorities and then setting a level past which you are not willing to go. And like you said, sticking with it. And I think if you're choosing, how am I going to spend that outside of specific tools? I think the first focus always needs to be on a quality product and then secondary 
focus is on promotion and advertising. Because if you put money into promotion and advertising with a product that is not up to par, you are wasting your money because you're not going to get as much uptake. People aren't going to click as much as they could if the reviews aren't high enough quality because people aren't loving what you put together or there's issues about your product that are making them give you less than five star reviews you're wasting your money in the promotion side you can always scale up promotion later but if you don't have a product that will sell on its own then you are going to have trouble with that scaling up and it's never going to be as financially efficient as it could be yeah and i think all these things that we said lead to the moment in which you have to sit down see the data and uh, trying to realize, okay, this is what I've learned. This is the books that I have out there. This is how much I spent. This is how much I learned so far. When do I level up? Um, when do I decide that this is the moment in which I'm going to get a bit bigger? I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a bit more daring, I would say. I'm, I have a couple of uh, approach to this idea, but because I'm really starting out, uh, uh, this year, I, I would like your feedback. I'm just going to tell you what I will do uh, when I get to that point is um, I want to make sure first that I have enough uh, um, uh, backlist, a backlist uh, and products that I can use to advertise and to cross promote. Uh, but even before that, uh, Krista, uh, in the previous episode, we spoke about the, uh, the fire hose approach, right? When, that moment when you have enough uh, books that you can just release them one, once every two months, every three months, or even after every month. I want to make sure that I am on a point that I can do that for a sustainable uh, period of time, uh, especially as I'm starting out and I don't have anything in my back. If I don't have anything in my back, it's double more important, right? So I would say I'm going to level up when I have something in my back uh, that I know people might enjoy after I've, they have finished something, uh, uh, for example, that I drive traffic on with, uh, for example, a book promotion. But if I don't have anything else, people are not going to buy anything else. That means there's going to be less revenue for me. And that's going to make all the plans that I have for future projects less likely because I will have less resources. So. That's what I will do, making sure that I have enough products in my bag so that I can release them, ready product. I'm talking about products that have the cover, that has been edited, they just need to be released in a strategic way because we are strategic entrepreneurs. Uh, and once uh, that's been done, I have to stick to that publishing schedule. I can't just say I have six product that I'm, products that I'm going to release this year, and then at the end, I'm going to release two or three. I need to stick to that, especially if I set up expectation, right? Crystal. So these are the two things that I will do in the leveling leveling up phase. So when to leap? How would you take that approach? Would you take it a, a different way? Would you give some other suggestions on that regard? Uh, I think that's a good that's a good kind of benchmark. Is is making sure that you have more in reserve than you have put out, whether that's talking about products and, and word count and stories, or whether it's talking about your advertising. One of the things about leveling up is that often that comes with investing in ads and building an ad platform now that we, we can, as much as we would wish we could escape it and just completely be content focused and you can, but if your goal is really to hit, you know, the six figure kind of numbers that you see authors talking about, and that's where you want to head, you will need to do that with advertising. That isn't something that happens just on its own. And so the thing to remember is that we're always front loading our payments and we're not collecting revenue for a very long time when it comes to the author world. So whether it's me investing in editing short stories and then converting them to audiobooks and all of those things, I'm investing now and I'm going to make that money back over time. But for some things, it may take quite a while. You know, my audiobooks that I invested in, it's going to take at the current rate, it's going to take about two years before that first batch has paid itself off. And that was okay because I invested that money from profits of the eBooks. So I'm not missing it. I didn't have to pull that out of my household budget in that way. It was in my publishing revenue stream and I could reinvest it in the business 
and feel comfortable waiting for a couple of years for that to pay off. Same thing when you pay for editing and cover design and everything up front, it's going to be a while before you make back all of that money, especially when you're first starting out. Once you have a list built and you have a really strong um, base on your mailing list, you can actually do quite a bit. So now I know when I put out a new book in the first week to first month, depending on uh, the title and what it is, I can make back all the money it costs me to produce that book within the first month. And then after that, any money it makes is going into the revenue pot for supporting other things. But it takes a bunch of books to get there. That's not how you start off in the beginning. And that's why we are constantly focused on getting you to build your mailing list. Because if you have that crowd of true fans, those thousand true fans who will buy whatever you put out, you can pay your production costs on any book with a thousand purchases, right? So that's just something to think about when you're thinking about building when to scale up and when to start paying for some more of these things. If it's going to mean you can spend a lot more time writing and if you have the money to invest and if you are kind of ready to make that next leap, then that's how you'll know. You'll have money left in your account at the end of the month. You will start receiving royalties, but you always need to plan for a bit of a buffer period because when you do start those ad spends and you start increasing those things you pay for ads in real time and the money doesn't actually arrive in your bank account for about two months so you have to really make sure that when it's time to do that scaling up that you have a buffer you have a cushion you have a way to make those payments to keep that momentum going while you're waiting for that money to come in ideally yeah. without mortgaging your house because that is not a thing that we recommend yeah, not 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 a good thing, and it's something that I'm noticing also on my author business. I started doing uh, ads with Amazon. This is a true story. Like no, around three months ago, and I'm definitely seeing what uh, Crystal have been uh, saying. Like you need time to build momentum. Uh, you need to understand what you're doing, uh, and you need data in order to understand. That's the problem, or the good thing. It depends. But if you need to have time. And you have to have latitude. That's what basically we're saying. You have to have room to maneuver. Uh, you have to uh, be able to understand you're going to do mistakes. And very uh, transparently speaking, like the first and the second months, I really didn't make any money out of the Amazon ads that I put out there. But I learned things so that in the second and in the third months, I could uh, target the keywords that I was seeing uh, were having effect on my books, on the sales. And on the third month, the things went a bit better. So I'm learning. And that's everything that we have been saying to you up to this moment is a learning curve. And it's going to be, be taking time. What we are saying here is that if you have a system and if you stick with that, the budgeting is one of that uh, things, uh, do whatever it works for you. But realize that, as always, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. There are some things and some tools that you can focus on. But ultimately, Crystal, this is something I really believe. Uh, you have to have a set of skills uh, that you can only build by publishing one book after the, the other. You can do that after two books. Uh, and then uh, uh, you have to see what other people are doing. You have to keep uh, uh, getting yourself out there, adapt to whatever is happening in the market. And again, at the same time, you have to have the data to take the next decision because if you don't do that, it's like shooting aimlessly. You don't know what you're doing. So if there is something, a lesson that you take out of all of this is like try to learn from your mistakes if you made some and gather the data, stare at that and make it be your teacher. And luckily for you guys, we are big on sharing our mistakes. So our next few episodes, we're actually going to take a deep dive into each of the areas of the publishing process. And we're going to tell you all the mistakes we made, all the expensive choices that you don't have to make because we're going to share with you exactly what we did and what happened and how we are going to do it better now. So uh, definitely make sure you join us and hit the subscribe button so that you can get those future episodes. We're going to do a whole series on that for you. But before we go, we have to do our curious jar. And it's that time of the day. It is that time of the day. I'm sticking my hand in. Tell me when to stop. Okay, go now. Good. Okay. Orange one. 
<laughs> Aren't you glad you get to play with the curious jar? <sighs> okay, so excellent question here. Do you sometimes wake up with whole story reels in your head? How do you capture that before it fades away? I have the answer to that question right away. Yeah, full disclosure. So it will happen sometimes that I wake up in the night and I have an idea and I just have to wake up, take my notebook, open it up, cracking it open and just write the idea. And imagine my, like at three in the morning, I would be like, and then I will have this pen and I will just write something. And then I will be like, okay, I'm good. The idea is there. I, I don't have to do anything else. So I go back and sleep. And the morning after, I will have no idea what I've written because I was reading basically. So either I will not be able to read my own writing, which is quite flattering. And at the same time, funny. I think, I think you should cut this. <laughs> no, don't cut it. Uh, or the other thing is uh, um, the story that had uh, somehow an amazing impact on me in that moment because I was living the dream doesn't really make any sense. So I can't honestly say that I ever used an idea that I had in a dream and that ended up in one of my published books uh, so far. That's something that I, uh, I do remember. Um, I don't know what's your experience on that uh, regard. Um, dreams usually. They are nice, but most of the time I don't even remember my dreams. Is that good? Is that bad? Tell me something. It just means you sleep deeply. Yeah, so that's probably not a bad thing. What about you? I I don't I don't wake up generally with ideas in the night. That's not a thing. I pride myself on ninety eight percent of the time being a rock star sleeper, actually, and so I burn myself out in the daytime and then I crash hard and then wake up the next morning. But I do get flashes is maybe the best way to put it, but it always happens when I'm awake and when I'm out and about doing things. So it could be that I hear a snippet of a song lyrics and all of a sudden I can see characters in my head. I can see a scene happening. I can hear dialogue. It's like somebody flicks a switch and the story starts. So it is a bit like like a reel. Like if you think of it like pushing play on a movie scene, that's a bit how stories come to me. And sometimes it's a, an image that will start that. It, it's why I love doing the cover designs and why I love finding pictures for all my characters. I have on my website a meet the neighbors section, which is uh, actual images of all the characters from my books and I use those in the writing process as well but part of my process is I will find a song that feels like the story to me and collect images and all of that and sometimes sometimes I start from the outside in like I start with a song or I start with an image and other times um, I s just see or feel like I can feel what the characters are feeling and then I go find the things that fit that. Um, so there isn't one way, but definitely I get these sort of waves of story that come at me. And the way I capture that is I always have, a, well, I have like five notebooks within reach, but I always, my current one is right here. Um, I always have a, a notebook with me everywhere. And I, that's my first space where I will jot down any ideas that come to me. And I'll just free write sensations and I'll make sketches and whatever it is that is coming to me. And then also after that, when things get a little more coherent and I can see where that fits into the larger world of River's End, then I put it into, I have some ideas documents that things go into. And if it's super clear that it's its own book, or if I already can see like the cover image that it goes with, or I know the character that story belongs with, then I will actually start a Scrivener document and start outlining um, once I know where it fits. But yeah, that's how I capture the thoughts and I don't let them go away. All right, what do you do? Um, I'm curious, do you wake up with story reels running in your head and how do you capture them before they go away? So you can tell us in the comments below wherever you are listening to or looking at this episode. 
And if you have a curious jar question, because we are getting quite low in our jar, then you can email it to ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com and we'll add it to the mix. For show notes and links to resources that we mentioned and for the coupons and discounts on the tools we love, please visit us at strategicauthorpreneur.com. Now, you know how important book reviews are. And podcast reviews are equally important. So if you can leave us a review or a rating wherever you're listening to this, we will be forever grateful. Take care, happy writing, and we'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Oh, I didn't mute myself. You listen to them all. (laughs) No, no, I heard all of that. No, wait. Good, good, good. That that uh, it's going to boost my self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Yes. Cersei, 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 Cersei. Whatever. You know what? It's a different red shirt. Jared <laughs> made fun of me, but is it, I is it different? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Jared might be not the only one that makes fun of you from now on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all good. Look, this one has no sleeves. <laughs> oh yeah, they're and, gonna and see then, like it. no collar, and, and yeah. everybody's gonna see that crystal. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's okay. So I would, and I'm terrible with math. Let me just uh, figure that out. <laughs> do, 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 interlude. Near, 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 near. Uh, okay. So I would have. To that can't be right. I did that backwards. <laughs> $50 divided by 70 cents. <laughs> Not helping. I know. <sighs> okay. <laughs>